Welcome to the Peace Garden. Uh, my name is Melvin, Melvin Giles. I'm the uh, fourth son of Reverend Robert B. Giles, Sr. Uh, I was born in Chicago, by the way of Mississippi. And now uh, I've been living in the Twin Cities uh, most of my life. Um, I consider myself a peacemaker. Um, I like to blow peace bubbles. I like bubbles instead of bullets. Um, and there's a lot about me, and I'm sure some of what you want to know, I can be telling you who I am with the other questions too. But the main thing is I'm, I'm a peacemaker. I'm a child of the universe. As you yourself have said, and we know that as well, that you are a peace activist. So what was your inspiration or motivation to work on, on the field of peace? Hmm. I, I would say just living. As uh, I said, my father was a minister, was a minister while he was living. Um, it, it seems like the natural way to go. Uh, as an African American in particular, um, part of that culture is about working for justice as a way of living. Um, and I prefer doing peace work, prefer smiling, prefer taking life a lot lighter. Um, so peace is one of the best ways to do that. Instead of, for instance, politics, going into politics is nice, but um, that kind of can come with a heavy burden. Okay, uh, as, as we know, and you said that we are sitting in a peace garden, would you introduce your peace garden? What is this all about? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, yeah. This here, uh, this is the peace garden. You see this peace sign here. Uh, started probably 2001, 2003. Um, started with a high school. Uh, and this group called Afro Eco, which is a group of African Americans and uh, alliance of people of color, of trying to uh, get people to connect back to the land. So uh, the high school needed some land. Uh, my neighbor here, we had this property. They decided not to go in on it, and we started a peace garden. But it was for environmental learning, um, kind of want to kind of science-based um, to help young people, for sure, kids, to learn about where strawberries come from, for instance, or get elders to be able to go back to their roots. And so this is like a demonstration garden. And, yeah. who, uh, who actually owns this? Did you say that you shared the property? And yeah, uh, it's private property, but it's a community garden, so the neighborhood owns it, kind of like. And right now we are going through uh, redesign, redeveloping to make it even more inviting, more welcoming. Um, this garden has hosted um, birthday parties, it has hosted uh, certain type of community graduations. Um, in the States we have this thing called National Night Out. It happens um, this first Tuesday in August. They do it nationally. People come out at nighttime to um, celebrate but to get to know their neighbors. In this neighborhood, which is Aurora St. Anthony, which is part of the old Rondo neighborhood, we do an afternoon out. We do an afternoon out to make sure that uh, people who work s second and third shifts can be able to participate. And we also do it to make sure that our seniors, our elders can come out and meet people and just have a good time. So. We can also see uh, peace poles here can you in tell something about that concept yeah uh well uh, back in probably 1958 japanese man by the name of mr goi g-o-i uh, wanted to uh, try to be proactive regarding war uh, he had lived through world war ii and so he came up with this peace prayer or peace message was say may peace prevail on earth and he believed that uh, the more people would say that and would meditate on it, the more peace will become a reality. And so uh, this here, for instance, is a small peace pole. I call this a peace seed. Um, it's like an apple seed, only an apple tree can grow. This here is a peace seed, and only peace can grow from it. But a peace pole has the word, may peace prevail on earth, and it has it in different languages. And so 
I use it as a community tool, organizing tool. I believe the wood represents our spirit and the different languages represents our humanity. And um, these here are actually not peace poles, what you see behind us, but those are just poles. Uh, however, they are home. You see these bird houses back here. Uh, we have about four bird houses. And these birds are kind of smart because they only live in the wooden bird houses. The other ones, they look pretty. They even got a cell light on one of them, but the birds don't mess with them. Uh, but in a couple of weeks here, we will be planting a big peace pole um, in this garden. We try to tell people in this garden, we want them to be living peace poles, to walk like a, to walk straight up, to walk like a peace pole. So uh, I just read in, so may peace prevail on earth. Yeah. So where, where has this quotation come from? Um, again, it came from um, Japan, uh, from Mr. Goin, G-O-I, the World Peace Prayer Society. Um, they are locally out of New York State. Um, but their world headquarters is in um, a city in Japan. Um, and I'm one of their uh, peace representatives. So that, that's a quotation which has come from them? Yes. Okay. It's, it's not a verse, a Bible, or any other thing? No, it came from uh, the concept maybe it's like a prayer. Yes. They also used the, um, another message of may peace be in our homes and communities. But the original is, may peace prevail on earth. Uh, so, so you have, you're a peace, peace activist. Mm. What ways did you adopt to work on, on, on peace, to, to make others work on yeah. peace as well? Okay, yeah. that's a good question. Uh, part of my background uh, was the uh, Catholic Charities Organization, Social Service uh, I happened to be the d director of a local neighborhood Catholic Charities. And I was uh, very blessed to have a cool boss. Uh, and this was in the late 90s. It was during Bill Clinton time period. Uh, during Bill Clinton time period, he gave the nation a challenge to talk about race. Um, for most people of color that I know, particularly Native Americans, First Nation people, African Americans, Latinos, um, to be able to get peace, you got to have justice. And not many folks have that justice. So you have to try to find ways to um, get that justice. Uh, fortunate for me, I've surrounded myself with good people. Uh, even though I did not know the man at the time, Dick Bernard, for instance, he's a good man. But surrounding myself with people who helped me to just see different ways of responding. But while I was at Catholic Charities, uh, what really probably inspired me with Peace Pose, actually, was knowing that I had to work with the police department and had to find ways to do that. So one of the ways of working with them was the bubbles, peace bubbles. Cops carry, they have bullets. And so I had to find me a weapon too. My weapon was bubbles. And it was one that was mutual. Um, and in this neighborhood, uh, there was some violence that happened. And people started pointing fingers. Who was at fault? Was it the cops? Was it the gangs? Was it parents? And that's when I found out about peace poles. Because for me, it was everyone's fault or everyone had a responsible responsibility to try to change it. And so uh, that old concept of Gandhi, if you want peace, you have to start with yourself. And so for me, having to start working on my own self and knowing that most of my anger, my resentment was towards the police or towards people who kept justice from me or, what I, or who I thought kept justice from me. And so over a period of time, I guess the work would be, was able to start transforming that anger and turning that over through love. And so um, created this group called the Peaceful Love Warriors. Um, and it was like we s were seeking peace, but we was warriors. And, but we could only win overcome by love. 
And so um, a good example of that was in prior to 9-11, 8-25-01, um, the Ku Klux Klan came in town. At that time, our governor, I don't know if you ever heard of this governor named Jesse Ventura. Okay, he was the governor here. He gave the KKK permission to march on the Capitol, our state Capitol. There were some people who really did not like that at all. And they formed a group called Can the Clan, like kick the can clan's butt. Uh, that group was in Minneapolis. We had a group over here of mainly young gangsters who was in gangs who also wanted to meet the KKK. The Peaceful Love Warriors called a meeting. We had the police come, we had other folks come. We had about three different meetings. We even met with the Archbishop. And we decided that we was gonna do an alternative celebration. That instead of giving any attention to the KKK, we was gonna give attention to ourselves. And so we did a multicultural healing celebration where we had about eight peace poles. We had eight different, a whole bunch of different cultures where people would come and pour dirt actually on, on the pole as a symbolic symbol of our oneness and our together. We had Irish dancers, we had uh, uh, Native American drummers, uh, we even had police officers being saged by Native American uh, spiritual leaders. Um, and I believe it might have been the only time the police and gang members worked together side by side to patrol a parking lot. And so that concept of peace really took, took a leap of, not just a leap of faith at that time, but it really, it started inspiring people to see that uh, you didn't have to go around getting a headache because of things you didn't like. That you didn't have to try to knock down doors all the time. That if you uh, work together with other people, things can change. In the garden, we like to say many hands make light to work. So the more people you are working with, the lighter your, your, your job is, the load is. For me as a peacemaker, uh, for me as a peacemaker, I try to walk lightly. I try to carry myself a lot more lightly. Um, I follow the four agreements. Are you familiar with the four agreements? No. Yeah. Uh, four agreements. Uh, be truthful with your word. Uh, if you have nothing to say, you know, just chill out. Um, number two, don't take things personal, which is kind of pretty hard sometimes. And you have to practice not taking things personal. But the third one is the hardest probably, not to make assumptions. And not to make assumptions means sometimes you have to ask questions. You have to just, you just can't jump to a, assumptions. And then the fourth one is just to do the best you can and knowing that your best is gonna change from time to time. And uh, that helps me to be able to travel through the world pretty nicely. So where, where do these four agreements come from? It comes from uh, this Latina brother, I'm gonna say, Last name is spelled R-U-I-Z. And um, you can look him up. You can just Google the four agreements. He has uh, a new one now called the, the five agreements. Uh, but I think the five agreements is just basically just saying how do you unfold all that together, you know. And I think it's the concept is really just getting back to, getting back to the land, getting back to the spirit. And, uh, okay, Marwin, uh how much was this fact uh, affecting your mentality in work that you yourself came from an African-American community mm -hmm. which has traditionally been wronged in, in U.S. and, and probably has, has not, at least in, in past, has not, have, has not been treated fairly. So how much th this affected your thoughts and then your work? Okay. Um. I hope in a fantastic way. Um, as an African American, you are proud just to be, I stand on people's shoulders. Um, what other folks see as bad and terrible, as a black man, I see as strong and powerful.
to still be standing here. Um, I can go back, you know, there's that thing about seven generations when you can um, look back three generations and look forward and see your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Uh, for me, I had a couple opportunities to be able to say, I definitely knew my great-grandmother, I knew my grandmother, and I knew my father and my mother. And I knew their people and hearing their stories, definitely nothing to be ashamed of but only things to be very happy and proud of. And then just hearing other just stories basically of the African experience in America and being present now to be able to see my, my generation, then our children, our grandchildren, and for me to smile and say, I have been able to see a great, great now. You know, and it's like, that's not to me more blessings. Um, and so for me, it's to pass that on both ways. You know, most time you think about African Americans, you, which is fantastic. You think of Dr. King, Malcolm X, all those folks was great. Frederick Douglass, you know. So for me, it's knowing that I stand on their shoulders and I trust that, again, if I take myself lightly, when somebody get on my shoulders, they just gonna be floating, you know. They just float. So with my nieces and nephews, my cousins, when they're around me, I just want them to be just, I want them to be little, just fun creatures and believing that anything is possible, you know, anything is possible for them. We have seen, Melvin, uh, that somehow the pacifists, the peace lovers, mm -hmm. they want to inspire the whole world, they want to inspire the U.S. government to use more peaceful methods to, to conduct its foreign policy. But we see they not inspiring their own young ones, their own family members in, enough to come to streets, standing shoulder to shoulder with yeah. them and protesting for peace. Yeah. So how can they think that they would be able to, to inspire the U.S. government? Yeah. You are correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our country, America, you know, there's been three countries, America, Germany, and South Africa. All three of them legalized slavery. All three of them legalized apartheid. All three of those countries legalized kill these people. With that type of thinking, it takes so much to change that concept to change that concept. We see in South Africa, things have been changing, in particular without bloodshed. But the power structure is still having a hard time. Um, <coughs> I'm one of those who believe in, um, one of the trainings I do is called racial sobriety. And it basically say that m most Americans, we are racially dysfunctional. And until we can even look at that question, there's no way we can even go deeper to look at the question about peace. In the 80s, I used to do a lot of uh, peace work around the nuclear freeze. And um, after, it took me a couple of these uh, protests that I went to to realize that, you know, people are talking about freeze, 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 but most of the folks there who was white could not understand that their hearts was frozen regarding people of color. Or as a man, as a man, how my heart could it be froze towards a woman, gender-wise. Those are the concepts, those little, those little issues are the things that give people peace. I eventually had to walk away from the nuclear freeze people because it was like they wanted peace, they're good people, but they still couldn't see this economic injustice. Um, the same thing happened with me uh, working within the healing community as far as uh, doing massage work and healing work, like some more good people. And they are even more love, love, love and peace, peace people. But again, a lot of them could not understand, could not get out of their denial. So part of racial sobriety means for me is that we all need an intervention 
And it's the same with peace, that we have to get out of our denial. We have to really open our eyes to see a different worldview. And once we see that, that's pretty hard sometimes. And most time what happens, people get kind of mad. And they just want to go back to the way they used to think. And it's kind of like a death. So racial sobriety uses the principle of Kuber Ross, the grieving process, that you have to go through a grieving process to understand, even to begin to understand the concept of what true peace means, what wanting peace for someone else other than yourself, for wanting, you know, the whole, it's harder to sometimes to really receive something when your hands is like this. It's kind of hard to receive stuff. So the concept of racial sobriety is saying that we have to just go through these stages of grief. You know, the whole denial, the whole anger, the whole bargaining with ourselves. You know, uh, depression. And that depression, most people don't survive that depression. They rather just stick to what they are used to instead of doing something different. But if they can make it through there and get to that acceptance, racial sobriety says you need to take a couple extra steps then. You have to learn how to forgive yourself. And um, again, as Americans, forgiving ourselves is not part of the concept. You know, we, we go to somebody else and let them forgive us. We have to learn how to forgive our own selves. Another part is being a, uh, going out there and being, a, what I would call an ally. And an ally is somebody, for me, who's going to speak up for somebody even when they are not there. So for instance, if we are just having a conversation and I start telling you something bad about a different culture, if you are a good ally, you would kind of tell me to um, listen to myself or you will walk away. Most time, people don't know what to do. It doesn't mean that they are bad people. People just don't know what to do. And that's part of the racial dysfunction in this country. It is getting better. Of course, people like to say Obama's president, so it's really better. I would say it's getting better. I think President Obama has been doing a fantastic job. I think he's been showing a leadership that people are not used to. People are still used to the leadership of carrying a big stick and just always shooting from the hip. It's so refreshing to have somebody who knows how to think. It's refreshing to have somebody who listens to his wife, who listens to his kids, and probably listens to some of his elders, you know. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question at all. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but yes, that, that was a good explanation. <laughs> but still, I would like to repeat the question okay. and, and try to get a more specific answer. Okay. Why have the pacifists not been able to inspire their own children? Okay. And, and what can be done to inspire those people? They have to inspire their own hearts first. You know what I'm saying? To, to inspire the other ones, they have to go through their own grieving process. Once they can really, most of these pacifists, peacemakers, once they can truly go down in their dark night of the soul, when they come back out of that, they shine. They don't have to say anything. People follow them. It's the ones who do the talking all the time. You know, can they, that talking, again, that first agreement, be impeccable with your word, be truthful with your word. You have nothing to say, just don't talk. The majority of the people in the world, they get nervous, so they just blah, 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 blah. They talk too much. Sometimes we just have to let our light shine. So, to, for me, I would say, the more they can just be the change, the kids will see it. In this garden, for instance, we do a children's garden. And we do a children's garden, uh, we really wanted 13, 14, 15 year olders. But what we got was babies mainly, three, four, five, six, seven year olders. But after a while, we realized that that's the age. The local group I work with here, World Citizen Inc., part of their mission is about peace education. And their elder, uh, Mr. Lynn Elling, you know, he, he just drives it in. You gotta start with the kids. You gotta start with the kids. 
but not so much by being preaching to them or by telling them how to go, but by just giving them and showing them some possibilities. The peace education that World Citizen Inc. does is not saying we have the answer. It's saying, come to us, let us all work on the answer together. People need a place to be invited in. You know, uh, most time it's always this hierarchy. The First Nation people have, and that's what I like about this peace symbol here. It's a circle. You know, it's not about who's on top, who's on the bottom. It's, it's kind of flat. Um, and those are more of the concepts of what leads us to true peace. Uh, the head lady of the World Peace Prayer Society in Japan, uh, she has a book called The Keys to Happiness. And she introduces the concept for people to start thinking about effect and cause instead of cause and effect. And she basically is saying you have to put out there what you want to create the cause that you want. Right now we are still, in, as a society in America at least, too much into blaming. You know, we have to stop. Like I was saying to you before, when we had violence here, people would blame that person. They would blame that person. Instead of just saying, let's come together and just see what we can do together. You know, those, and, and it, takes, it takes people at least three or four or five, sometimes a hundred times to hear something. Uh, I know it took me a long time, and it still is taking me a long time to uh, understand a lot of things. You know, I just tell people I'm kind of slow. But, you know, if they, if they hang with me long enough, I, I probably get it. But things, it, man, as they say, we just use a small part of our brain. You know, the more we can just lighten up, the more we make more room. Uh, I like that concept about um, the more we stretch our comfort zone, um, that it makes room for a more learning zone. And, uh, and when you hang around kids all the time, that's all you can do is keep on learning stuff. Okay, Marwin, uh, since you, you have given so much of your life to peace, what do you consider has been your biggest achievement in, in this area? Being part of the Giles family. I think uh, just being part of the family I was raised with has been probably the best thing in my life. I have three great older brothers. Uh, and I like to jokingly say, they, I used to be the youngest, but now I look the oldest probably. Um, but I couldn't have more love. Uh, my father and my mother died when I was young, when she was young. And uh, so my father raised all of us. Um, and we was raised in the church. So have, you know, my accomplishment has just been being loved. Um, as far as stuff I do out in the world, you know, it's like, it just bubbles, you know. It's, it's a, I'm fortunate that I have learned to, when I was in my 30s, I decided to say I'm gonna be in eldership training because the people around me, I could tell that they was constantly trying to either groom me or just work with me. And so for me, it's how do I do the same thing, you know. Um, yeah, my greatest, thing is just if I can just keep on breathing and keep trying to be a better person every day, you know, um, and being thankful. Yeah. Since you came from a family which, which had, uh, your father was a minister, mm -hmm. so there is a saying that if church and school had played its due role, mm -hmm. the world would have been much, much peaceful place. Yeah. Probably the church is not playing its due role anymore. Right. What do you think? I think for most part, I think that's kind of a true concept or has been changed a little bit. Uh, it definitely hasn't been the way it was when I was growing up. Or I see my brother over there. Uh, like I said, see if you can see him, man, he looks so much younger than me now, don't he? Uh, he's supposed to be older. Uh, yeah, and I think that's one reason the church has probably been losing some of their membership, you know, regardless of the denomination. And more people are trying to find another enlightened path, 
know, more people are taking that step, getting closer to the edge, going to the cliff, and saying, trusting, you know, and, and where that's leading, I, I, I don't know, uh, but I have a feeling, again, it's going to keep leading people back to their selves. Uh, for a long time, I used to think I was having me this journey from my head to my heart. And, uh, and it kept stopping right there. But as soon as I started from my heart to my head, man, I almost knocked myself down. It was like, I just need to start with my heart all the time. If the church has lost anything, it has lost the heart. But I really think right now, I think the church actually is on a healthy comeback. Uh, I particularly think uh, the new pope is, again, trying to help folks see things a little differently. Uh, I think sometimes we go to the other extreme sometimes and try to be too respectful and don't want to say certain things. Uh, but I do think uh, as far as faith, and I think there's a difference between the faith and the religion. You know, that religion is really too much of the man-made stuff. Again, the blaming, the trying to be in control, whereas the faith has to do with that feeling again. Where you have to really, sometime, all you, as my grandmother would say, sometimes all you can do is just sit and rock and let patience have her perfect way. And uh, that's hard to do. Okay, uh, let me uh, ask this question a little differently again. Okay. Uh, I think, yes, you talked about people moving away from, from church or things like that, but we also see some lacking on the part of the church the clergy as well we don't hear much from the pulpit war is bad peace is good and my followers you need to work for peace once you're out of this church you're gonna do something which mm. would help the cause of peace in the world and things like that we don't hear it anymore well i know uh the churches that i go to the churches that my neighborhood people go to they hear it I know, the, I know the black Baptist churches and the black Catholic churches, I, they hear it because it's, that's the way their life is. Sometimes you don't hear it because it's a privilege not to have to, you can keep it away from you. You can keep, and most people think they can keep it away. Uh, most of the churches I know of, most of the uh, flyers I get from churches, they may not be saying it a certain way but they definitely are saying, how do we feed this community? How do we help uh, get more kids adopted? How do we stop racial profiling? How do we make sure people have health care? So the churches that I go to, the churches that people I know, uh, they are still fighting for justice. You know? Yes, we understand your concern and we mm. understand that they are working on these issues. Mm. But it's a general belief that they are doing not much for international peace and war. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do re raise these issues which are direct and immediate concern of their followers. Yeah. But they do not yeah. take up the issues of war and peace in the world community yeah. to the extent and in the way it should be taken. Possibly. I would say to you, because I, I, I like the way, way you say that, it makes me smile actually because I think so much work right now is being done on the ground level. So much work is being done in the grassroots level. Uh, so we may not be hearing it from the regular sources, but on this ground level you know, or on this other social media level, the drum beat is beaten. People are working together so well that the stuff we do hear probably is saying that nothing's happening. I can guarantee you, you go into a certain reservation right now, especially up north, it's called self-determination. It's almost like saying, we don't care what the media think no more, because what's important is us. It's, it's a part of racial sobriety again. To become more functional, you have to break rules. Some of the rules you have to break is the rules of don't tell, don't ask, don't, don't trust. People are beginning to trust each other. People are beginning to ask questions. 
people are beginning to tell things. They got too many uh, smartphones out here now. People are seeing when cops are bad. People are seeing when cops are great. Stereotypes are being broken. What doesn't make news too much is when cops are great. <laughs> what don't make news mo that much is when neighbors help neighbors. It make news sometimes, but what we usually hear is about death, destruction, things that get people attention, things that are based on people's fear. I think part of the part of what is happening, this little struggle right now, we're getting into this critical mass of what people want to put their thoughts on. If they want to put their thoughts on just fearful things or they want to put their thoughts on hopeful things. And, and a lot of hopeful things are kind of invisible. We know that old saying about uh, what's true is invisible to the eye, you know? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, again, uh, discussing the same issue in a different <coughs> way. In the United States, we come across so many good people like you, Dick, and others, and so many organizations and church as well as you, you, oh, yeah. you say, working and, and, and professing the cause of peace, but we do not see any meaningful impact being made. Mm -hmm. We don't, don't see any restless nights in White House because of so many people out there asking for peace. So where is the disconnect? Where is the, what's that which is not letting make impact? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a strawberry, still green. It'd be red one day. It's big right now. It takes time. <laughs> it takes time. T-I-M-E. It takes time. That's all. Some things, it's like flowers. Some things are here for a season. Or like trees. Some things, some things have impact. This is impact right here kids walking in, that's impact. The news is not going to say this is impact. How are you guys doing? He's a pretty garden. Thank you so much. You like it? Yeah. Good. Wow, peace bubbles to you. Every Wednesday, I want to see you guys here next Wednesday, okay? I want to see you here next Wednesday, 3.30. We do children's garden, okay? Because I was just showing this gentleman this here. You know what this is? What is it? Okay, good. You ever see a green strawberry? Yeah. No. Don't eat it. No. It's right. supposed to be red. It's so. supposed to be red. It's going to take some time. So you come back, we're going to have What's some red this? ones. This is a peace pole. What's that for? It's a seed. A seed for what? To grow things. So you put it in there and go? It will. Just like everything in here. What is that? Start like a seed. What is that? Those are bird houses. So they, all the birds Look, live over there. And that will get y'all too. So I'm going to see you guys next Wednesday, okay? Uh, Look at the window. Oh, I see you. Oh, yeah. That's Good really job. scary. Thanks for stopping in. That's a ghost. A ghost. That's the impact right there. Yeah. That's the so, impact. So, um, the fact is that you, you are a, an optimistic person, everyone should be, and you think that over time these people would coalesce and collaborate with each other and eventually, eventually create an impact. Yeah, I don't see 100%, and, uh, but I do see... I think already it's probably 60, 40, 70, 30. But our country, again, to be break these rules about it has to be 100% to be real or it has to be a certain way. When we can just start appreciating and being grateful, um, that's when we see the impact actually. It's here all around us, but we only see it when we are ready to see it. Yeah. So that's going to be my last question. What message would you like to give to mm. you see this is going to be a public kind of video people would be seeing it especially those who would be interested in cause of peace okay so what message would you like to put across to people public in general and youth in particular regarding peace i would want to just say take it light um have patience um, but start with yourself be able to fill your heart and let your heart just fill you and you know how they say surround yourself. I believe I'm somebody who got 
you know, I got the best angels. Sometime, I'm, sometime I, I just can't believe I get all the parking spots all the time. I get, I run into people all the time, even today, talking to you. I mean, this is a blessing. So my message for folks would be to blow some bubbles, um, try to think about effect and cause. Instead of always saying, this happened because of this or whatever, to, to there's a, can't think of the brother's name, Brother James uh, does, as a man thinketh, you know, it's like we are what we think. And if we just keep thinking fearful and negative thoughts, that's all we're going to see. So that effect is we have to start thinking beautiful thoughts. We have to start thinking bright thoughts. We got to take the high road, you know. Uh, part of uh, rules of conduct in this garden here is we got to be cheerful, you know. And you can't be cheerful all the time. And when you can't, it's okay. Either touch the dirt or get out the garden. But the more we can just have healthy thoughts, it might, and it will take a lifetime. It will take a lifetime. And we just have to keep being okay. Like if we confuse us, say, we know we might go slow, but just don't stop. Just keep on moving. We, we be reaching it. You know, so. Thank you, Melvin, for yeah. such a nice interview and your time and your effort. Oh, thank you, brother. <laughs>